Hi, welcome to the Great Beyond Tap House in Shoreditch in London. I'm Ollie Kensington and I'm going to be giving you some tips today about lighting an interview. We're going to be meeting the owner, John, here in a few hours' time, so I'm just getting prepped at the moment, um, setting up, making sure I can find an angle that's going to look good, getting the light set up, and so that when John arrives, there's not too much messing around. We can pretty much start straight away. We're going to be conducting a quick interview with him, and I'm going to be talking to you whilst I'm doing that about uh, how I'm using the lights, how I'm setting them up, how I'm working with some of the uh, quite challenging um, things that we have going on in this space at the moment. Um, we have at both ends of this um, little sort of arch that we're in, we have natural light coming in. Um, we can't block that out. We don't have the means to block it out. There's no uh, blinds or anything on those. So we've got um, some natural light coming into this space. Uh, we've got some practicals. There's some fairy lights that are just part of the decoration of the bar that we uh, uh, have got on currently. And I Hopefully they will uh, stay on. Uh, we'll see how the color temperature looks once they're on camera. Um, and I'll just be giving you some tips as we're going, just things that I've picked up throughout my career. Sometimes I'm working in very curated locations where we've got a lot of control. We've got all the lights that we need, control over um, the set and the location as well as on our talent. Uh, this isn't gonna be one of those times, but then I've shot interviews in, in much less uh, controllable spaces than this. I've um, shot on uh, observational style documentaries um, and there you literally just walk into a space. It could be someone's home, uh, it could be out and about. I've shot in gyms, I've shot in people's gardens and their homes. Um, purely observational, very hands off. And of course, in those situations, you won't even have the level of control that we're going to be having here, which I've started off by saying is a very uncontrolled environment. So there are shades of grey with this. And I think it's important to um, have in your toolbox some techniques that will get you out of a pinch when you're working in environments where there's not complete control. Um, and also just knowing where you can let things go. Before I start going much further actually with the uh, camera gear, and with the lights and such like, uh, the first thing that I would do in a space like this where we have so many kind of variables that are slightly beyond our control is to mitigate where I can. So some things you can't do anything about. So for example, we can't stop that natural light coming in through that window at the end or at the other end here. Um, I've already got half a plan of how I might try and use that. Uh, so, so, for example, um, I've only got two lights with me today. Um, <laughs> thank you, Wex. You've really made this very challenging for me. Um, so what I'm thinking is uh, one of the big things with interviews is a catch light in the eye. So I'm already planning that one of these uh, large openings at the uh, end of the arch where we can't stop the natural light coming in, because it's uh, north facing, it's diffuse, it will actually, and it's large, it's probably going to make a really good catch light. Uh, in fact, you're probably seeing it catching in my eye now, hopefully. Um, so I've already got plans for what I can do about the things I can't control. But in terms of the things I can control, um, I'm going to just sort those out now. So there's two things I spotted immediately. First of all, we have fairy lights along the um, uh, sort of head height along the wall here. Uh, and that would be great. Some nice sort of interesting bokeh uh, for the interview. We'll probably have John stood up. Um, but we've also got some festoon lights up the top here. Now, these festoon lights, they look all right to me. Uh, but the problem with our eyes is that they are really good at averaging out color temperature discrepancies and our cameras aren't very good at doing that. So rather than me sort of thinking, oh, they look all right, I'm just going to presume that they're giving off an, a, a, an unhelpful tint. Um, I'm not going to see them anyway. So because of the interview, because of the framing we're going to have, we're not going to see these. And because I've got my own lights, I don't really need them in terms of overall illumination of my talent. So I think it just makes sense just to turn them off, just to rule them out entirely. I don't think they're going to add anything. They could only potentially sort of cause pr trouble in terms of tint. So we have a very bright, saturated red rug on the floor. Um, there's literally nothing to stop us moving it. And there's every reason to do that because we don't want any uncontrolled light source. And that includes reflections. It's often forgotten, I think, uh, people can think of light sources and they might think of blocking them or using them, but they don't always think about reflected light. And, and what's going on on the floor is really important in terms of reflections, both audio reflections, interestingly, and light reflections. In terms of echo, we, you, know, you can put sound blankets down on floors to control echo in spaces. So think of it in the same way. It's, some, it's, it's a frequency, it's a wavelength 
that's hitting a reflective surface, surface and bouncing off. In this case, um, we don't want any reflected light on the rug. That deep red might then reflect back up into our talent's face and, and just make them look a bit hot and bothered, which potentially could influence the way that the viewer uh, sees the interview with this person. And we may want that, we probably don't. So I'm gonna move the rug, I'm gonna turn off these festoon lights, and then I can set about uh, getting my lights in place, which I have complete control over, and making sure that they do exactly what I want them to do on my talent. So this is a Peak Design, I think this is the 45 litre bag. It's absolutely amazing, um, I love it. It's a seriously heavy kit, you'll see in a minute why. Um, and it's really comfortable to wear on two shoulders. Um, and uh, even when you're old like me with a fragile back, it's good. Um, I'm gonna show you the most important thing in this kit bag before I get onto the boring cameras, and that is my chart. Uh, anyone who's seen me do anything before will probably have seen me working with these charts. Um, they are just the most low tech, uh, probably cheapest thing that's in this bag. And yet it's the thing that um, gives me consistency, makes sure that the talent always looks correct, the skin's correct, uh, exposed correctly. It just does everything that I want it to do. And it goes absolutely everywhere with me. Um, in terms of actual cameras, let me open up my camera cube for you. Um, I always tend to have two bodies with me these days. Um, my, I don't know if main camera is the right word. I, I use them fairly interchangeably, but my C70 is what we're gonna be using today for this interview. Just a single camera on this one, although actually I tend to shoot two cameras for interviews. And I do have a, a second body in this. So Canon C70 and Canon R5C. Um, very different cameras, but have an identical look. Canon put a lot of effort into keeping colors uh, consistent. Very easy to match the two, so they work really well as a multicam setup. Um, this one I tend to stick on a, a gimbal, capture a lot of B-roll with it, but it's also absolutely fantastic for uh, product work. I mean, it's 8K raw this can do, so it's incredibly flexible um, camera. C70, a couple of things that this has that this doesn't that makes it really useful um, in more flexible situations like we have here. Um, Built-in NDs, uh, two mini XLR inputs for audio, and the sensor in this um, is, uh, well, it's Super 35, whereas that's full frame, but it's uh, one of Canon's um, DGO sensors, dual gain output sensors. That gives me over 16 stops of dynamic range. Um, I find that really useful in terms of lighting, that's particularly relevant. The higher your dynamic range of your camera, the more stops of sensitivity it has in that regard. The more naturalistic you can be with lighting, the more it just looks like it looks with your eyes. Um, and that's really useful when you're doing sort of hands-off observational documentary work. Um, uh, but it's also just generally if you're working outside or if you've got uh, bright highlights and a very high dynamic range in your scene, that 16 plus stops is fantastic for that. In terms of lenses, I tend to have four lenses with me, but one or two of them I kind of interchange depending on the shoot. So for example, for today, because I know I'm shooting interviews, I've brought my um, probably favorite interview lens. This is the Canon RF 50mm f1.2. Uh, absolutely beautiful lens. Um, uh, the autofocus on this is whisper quiet, very quick, fantastic for interviews, particularly if I'm on my own, which I often am. Um, and uh, I'm relying on the eye tracking autofocus with the cameras to, to take care of that side of things. It's so good, in fact, I can leave this wide open at 1.2 for interviews. And also because it's a very good quality lens, even when it's wide open, it's nice and, and sharp. So that's uh, my favorite interview lens, that's with me. Um, today, I happen to have my 7200 f2.8 RF lens, really flexible lens uh, for all kinds of things, interviews, B-roll, uh, you name it, this is this is a wonderful lens. Uh, this is probably my favorite RF lens. This is the uh, Canon RF 35mm f1.8. Super, super useful. I love that focal length, I love 35mm, um, particularly on the full frame sensor of the R5C. It's, it's a really nice um, size frame for a kind of a utility lens, if you like. Uh, fully autofocus, nice, again, really quiet uh, UCM motors, stabilized, it's macro, it's 1.8, it's incredibly sharp, just a beautiful lens, I absolutely adore that one. And then what have I got down here as well? I have the 16 mil RF. So all RF lenses, I moved away from EF a couple of years ago, um, so I'm now entirely RF lenses. Uh, and the 16 mil, really light, 
Um, really, really easy to use on a gimbal. Um, that one's uh, another very useful one to have with me. That's cameras. Let's go over to this side. What do I go in here? Um, well, I've got batteries. I've got a little um, five inch Shinobi. I tend to run this on my gimbal or on top of the R5C. Incredibly lightweight. I mean, it weighs nothing. Battery lasts for hours and hours and hours. Um, a lot of people have Ninja Vs. I also have a Ninja V back in the um, studio, but this is the one I take around with me just because it, I, I don't often need to record onto the monitor. Um, uh, but uh, for viewing, it's high bright, works outside. Um, really nice, uh, lightweight monitor. I also have the seven inch, I won't bother getting this one out, but, um, or at least not now, I'll probably use it for the interview. I also have the seven inch Shinobi. Um, exactly same thing, really lightweight, uh, batteries last for hours, uh, but this also has cross conversion. So HDMI in and SDI out cross conversion. Um, you've got HDMI or SDI in and outs on that. So uh, another really useful monitor to keep with me. Um, what have I got in here? More batteries. I've got uh, the BPA 30s and A60s for the C70. Uh, I've got the MPF batteries for the Shinobis. Um, I've got the uh, LPE6 um, um, high capacity batteries for the R56 some tools, uh, some media. Uh, this is a uh, uh, MKE 400. This is the Sennheiser uh, top video mic. Often have this just on top for ambience, uh, for sync. Um, if I'm doing Vox Pops uh, and it's kind of handheld run and gun, this is incredibly good at isolating voices from about a meter and a half, two meters away. So uh, really useful um, uh, mic just to carry around with me. Uh, but I actually have my, pro my full proper uh, sound kit here, which I keep in a GoPro case. Um, don't know what happened to the GoPro, um, but a good hard case. So in here, I've got Sennheiser AVX wireless lav system. Um, I've got a little Zoom F2 uh, 32-bit float audio recorder, which is great for just sticking on someone and forgetting about. Um, my main uh, boom mic for interview scenarios like this, which uh, is deceptively small, um, <laughs> there's a joke there somewhere, is the Audix uh, SCX1. This is a hypercardioid uh, boom microphone, small but mighty. Um, use that a lot for interior interviews, really good frequency response, great isolation. Um, I would be using it here, but I'm not going to be today. Um, just in terms of pure practicality being on my own, so I'm gonna use the lav today with John. I've got some Ryko undercovers. I've got uh, uh, full-size XLR to mini XLR adapters, spare batteries. In here, I've got some Sennheiser. Uh, these are the in-ear, is it the EA500s, I think? I've forgotten which ones they are. Uh, I've got two um, lav mics, spare batteries, everything I need, really, for most situations. And the last thing I have here, a couple of, uh, well, a side grip, a top handle, um, and I can mount my um, Shinobi five inch to that. Got some HDMI cables in there. Crikey, what else have I got? In the other side, I can't be able to flip it over and open it up, but in the other side, I've got a long XLR cable. I've got um, a uh, Bright Tangerine Misfit Atom. I've got some format high-tech uh, uh, ND filters. I've got uh, a Tiffin, um, is it Tiffin? I actually can't remember. I've got a ProMist filter in there, um, uh, which fits into the, uh, into the map box. I've got a lot, a lot of stuff in here. Um, the reason I like the, um, I might use it, I'm on the C70, so I probably won't, but actually I like the ProMist filter. Um, they are uh, really good for just slightly taking that edge off the 8K sensor, the full frame sensor on the R5C, and it helps it match a bit better with the Super 35 sensor in the C70. Um, so there's, there's pretty much, you know, there's a one bag solution. There's a lot going on in here and a, a lot of options basically. And this goes with me all the time. Oh, and the only other thing I brought with me today, um, because everything else has been hired in, is the Sackler um, Flowtech 75 uh, sticks, uh, tripod legs, with the FSB8 um, head. This isn't the new active one, which is really cool. You can uh, balance it from the top. You don't need to come underneath it. Um, but this is just a slightly older head that I've had that I use on these sticks. And again, lightweight, super strong, super quick. Everything really, the, the theme that runs through all of this is 
very obviously high quality. That's a, the key key thing, but also lightweight um, and, and easy to use as a as a kind of a one man band. Um, not that I am always a one man band, but when I am, I want to make sure I've got everything and I can operate quickly and, and in a lightweight fashion. Um, and yeah, it, it does what I need it to do. So there you go, my kit bag. I better crack on. I've kind of dressed the location as best as I can. Um, done the things I was talking to you about before, about turning off the festoon lights and moving the red carpet. Um, so now I'm just going to start setting up the lights that I'm bringing into this situation. Um, we're using a couple of cob lights, um, cob LEDs. They're the, basically a large LED and they come with Bowens mounts on the front of them. And Bowens has been around for decades and it's hugely flexible. And that's why I'm using them on this particular shoot because we've only got two. So I need to make them work for the situation that we've got. I'll need to be able to modify them in uh, potentially a couple of different ways or even potentially unpredictable ways. You might not necessarily know in advance what you're walking into. And so these cob lights with the balance mounts, as long as you've got a couple of kind of utility, you know, maybe a lantern, soft box, uh, a few grids, bits and pieces like that, you can kind of turn up into a fairly unpredictable situation and, and should be able to modify the light in such a way that it will work for um, for your talent or, or the location that you're lighting. So we've got, um, uh, what are these, Amaran 300C and an Amaran 150C. I've not actually worked with these lights before. Um, I Personally, I own light panels, the Gemini 1x1. Um, I have two of those in the kit bag, which I'll go around with. I've got uh, a, another brand of cob light that I use for the reasons I just mentioned, which is uh, it's fairly inexpensive, but flexible um, and gives quite a good punch. Um, that comes around with me. I've got a number of LED tubes. I've got Quasar Science. Uh, I've got four two foot uh, Quasar Science rainbow LEDs. Um, I, when I first started experimenting with um, tube LEDs, I got the Astera, the Titan. I've um, got one of those kicking around. Um, I, you know, lights are just one of those things that I kind of acquire over time, and they they sometimes kind of go, oh, well, that'll be useful. Um, but today, as I say, we've we've got these two lights. So one's brighter than the other. Um, I'm going to be using the 300C as my key because it's bigger, brighter. Um, we're going to put that in a big soft box. I'm going to create as, as large and as soft a key as we can with that. Um, and then the smaller fixture, the 150C, we're going to um, fly above and behind our talent as a backlight. Uh, we're going to get a long, thin soft box with a grid uh, or egg crate on the front to direct that light and, and uh, help with the separation of our um, talent. And I'll talk more about that when we're actually doing that. Um, so I've got C-stands here ready, uh, ready and set up for that. Just one quick point, uh, a tip if you like, which I um, learned a few years back um, when you're setting up um, C-stands with boom arms is to make sure that the, the weight and the boom arm is out facing the way that you tighten it. Um, so uh, this knuckle, when it's tightened, if this has weight on it and it starts to drop, it's only gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. So eventually it will just completely stop. Whereas if this was facing the other way and it was starting to, uh, it wasn't tightened properly and any weight was on it, it would, it would start to move and it would get looser and looser and looser until it would just fall and crash. Um, so that was a tip. I can't even remember where I got that from, um, but that's a, a tip I picked up years ago, which I will pass on to you as if it's my own nugget of information that I've just pinched from somewhere else. Um, but uh, uh, that's how you should be setting up um, boom arms on C-stands and, and, and having them set up and ready um, to stick your lights on, which is what I'm going to do right now. It's a nice, long, thin shape, this uh, light box. This is the 30 by 120, um, which is actually going to be perfect. And, and this is often why I like to use tubes for this, um, because this is going to be up above and behind. And we're looking for that halo uh, across the shoulders, top of the hair. Um, so this kind of mimics the width and rough profile of what we're trying to do with the light. And that's always a good idea is choose a light that wraps around your subject. I see a lot of people going out with small little kits and small little lights, but yeah, they can be really punchy. Um, but ideally you want your light, or at least the modifier on it, to try and fill and wrap the subject. So my key will hopefully be at least as wide uh, as my subject, so it can wrap around it, my backlight as well, wrap over the top. Um, I like to think of the lights, as, as I say, as something that is physically wrapping around the subject. Um, so in terms of size, that's, that's why I've picked these size of modifiers. 
So I'm popping this egg crate on or grid on so that it controls the spill. As the light hits the um, diffusion that we've just put in there, it's naturally going to just spread. Um, light is uh, fairly uncontrollable unless you put something on like this, which is then going to uh, make sure that instead of the light coming out this way and, and a wide angle, it's going to channel it through these little black squares and help um, stop the light from spilling out all over the place. It's not intensifying the light because this is black, but what it's doing is it's cutting out anything that's heading out in these directions and it's narrowing the beam angle essentially of the light and just helping us uh, keep this off the rest of our set, for want of a better term or location, uh, and only on our talent. That's all it's uh, doing really, is just controlling it. And behind here we have our scrim, our diffusion layer, which is softening the light, um, uh, taking that edge off it, creating a, hopefully a nice soft wrap of backlight around John when we shoot our interview with him. Just an extra point actually about, because we're going to be booming this out, um, so we have it on the boom arm. Now, we realised that we didn't have any little baby pin uh, to attach the cob fixture into the knuckle on the end of the boom arm, um, which is ideally what we would have wanted because then we can control the angle and the spin and we've got more flexibility with the positioning of the light. Um, we can still do it because we've got um, We've essentially got a control here and we can spin this way, but it's not quite how I would want to. I did want a baby pin in here connecting into this knuckle. But anyway, we didn't have one, so I've done it this way. But uh, a good thing to bear in mind, and we, we don't have them with us today, but I do always usually have them on uh, uh, shoots when I'm doing this, is um, boa bags. So boa bags, I believe they're made by Matthews, the uh, grip people, unsurprisingly. Um, they're weight bags, similar to what you know, we've got going on down the bottom here, but they are two bags that are connected through, through a strip of material that's got neoprene on the underside. And you can wrap it around metal, um, anything really, and it will, because it's neoprene, it will grip really well. So it hangs onto the end of the boom arms and it counteracts the weight on the other end of the boom arm really well. So you can use that in addition to the weight bag on the back of the C-stand uh, on the leg to help counterbalance and just, uh, I think it's a, an extra way of being safe and making sure that this doesn't just spin round or fall or uh, anything like that because we don't want any accidents. Okay, so I've got the backlight rigged up or almost rigged up. I'm just um, setting the parameters on the light fixture itself. I'm in CCT mode, so I can dial in a, a Kelvin. Uh, these are um, RGBWW, so I've got control of the color, the hue, the saturation as well. In this uh, case, I'm just in the standard CCT mode. Uh, it's currently at 3,200. Um, a tip, I always do this where I've got uncontrolled natural light coming in, is I measure the color temperature of that light and then I use that information to put my artificial lights and set them so they're the same or, or close to the same. A really common thing I see happening is people with um, lights like these, they, they see the daylight coming in. We have a, a, a big door here and a big door there and windows above with daylight coming in. We can't control that. And a lot of people would look at that and go, oh, okay, well, let's set my lights to the preset light output, which is 5,600 Kelvin on these and, and most lights. Um, the problem is that's a huge assumption and natural light isn't always 5,600 Kelvin. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually measure that. So I'm gonna take a white balance reading off the color temperature of the light outside. You can do that with very expensive um, colorometers. Uh, I don't use one of those, uh, I'm gonna do a a cheap version of that and I'm just going to use my camera's white balance settings off a white balance card and I'm just going to read what the camera sees that color temperature of light as. My camera will tell me the Kelvin, it'll also tell me a, a green magenta tint value as well and I can take that information and I can put that into here. So let's say that we're getting a you know a, a plus two so there's a magenta a green tint and the camera's um, counteracting that by putting in some magenta um, I can then say, well, okay, well, there's some green tint coming in. Maybe there's some foliage. Could be any reason for that might come in. I can then take that information and I can set this to be as green as what's out there. So you're setting it so it's as wrong, if you like, or as varied away from that sort of preset ideal of 5600 Kelvin as that light source. Because if they're both the same, I can then white balance when I'm uh, doing my final uh, checks before the, we actually um, uh, start speeding and I can white balance everything and these should match. Now the daylight is gonna vary slightly. Um, at the moment we've got cloud cover that's just starting to lift and the sun's just starting to come out. So I'm gonna try and bear that in mind.
But what I'm not going to do is just assume, oh, it's daylight, it's 5600 Kelvin, stick that at 5600 Kelvin and start filming. Because what will happen is I'll have this and that different from each other. My white balance on my camera will then not know which one to go with. Uh, we've got some fairy lights, we've got some reflected light here. So there's any number of variables and to make sure that that's um, controlled, I'm going to take ownership of what I set this to and how I white balance for my target uh, uh, white point at the end. So hopefully it should mitigate uh, too many of these variables that we've got at the moment. Okay, so I'm just going to take that reading now using the white balance part of the chart. I'm facing this way because this is the light is reflecting from out here, the sunlight, and it's coming in towards our scene over here. So I don't want to be that way doing that because the light source that's reflecting in is then behind it. So I'm going to read what color temperature the daylight is coming in this way, and I'm just going to simply set my LEDs to match that. It's giving us a reading of 6060 Kelvin plus one. So it's picking up a tiny bit of green from somewhere. Actually, there's green railings all around here. So it could be as simple as that. There is actually a, a Velcro skirt that you can put on the back of this lantern, which can help control um, how much, again, it's just about controlling spill, how much spill is actually coming uh, off the back and sides of this lantern. Uh, we've got such a large space here and white painted walls. I'm not too concerned and if anything that spill will just help with the general level of illumination so I'm not concerned about putting the skirt on this. Uh, this is fairly big. I, I like to use as big a lantern as possible. This one's sort of medium to small. Uh, the bigger you can make your key um, and generally the softer you can make it for, for people as well, the more flattering it's going to look, the more it's going to catch in their eyes, uh, the more it will wrap around them. Generally speaking, uh, my key, I just want to be big and soft uh, and, and get that set up quickly first. And then actually I'll spend a bit more time thinking about the placement of the backlight. I'm using the, the two together. So my key is obviously my dominant light source. I'm using that for obviously illumination exposure, but I'm mostly using that for shading and thinking about how I'm uh, adding uh, shade to the other side by illuminating this side, because that shading is what creates three dimensionality. This is a two-dimensional medium, uh, film, TV, uh, online, whatever it is you're doing, you're looking at it on a flat screen, it's two-dimensional. So anything that we can do with a two-dimensional plane to make it convincingly three-dimensional, we should do. And if you think about drawing, if you draw a circle, it's clearly a two-dimensional shape. But if you shade one side of it, you're saying to the viewer that you have drawn a representation of a three-dimensional thing, a, a sphere or a ball. And that's what we're doing with the lighting. Far more than the exposure side of things is we're shaping. We're creating shade so that we have that disparity between the shaded, the fill and the key side, creating that depth, that three-dimensionality that we need to kind of push. Because the more three-dimensional our scene appears, the more the viewer will be sort of enveloped by it and feel like they're watching something sort of first hand and the more you can do that the more invested your viewer becomes in what they're watching and the more they're going to take on the narrative or the points that are being said in the interview or whatever it might be so it's a win-win-win so I'm going to get this set up and lit um, and then going to place the backlight oh and that's another point actually about three-dimensionality that's another reason why the backlight is so important is because it creates that halo that edge which essentially cuts out the, uh, almost like a an illuminated silhouette of your talent and that brings them forwards. And it's also why I'm using shallow depth of field with this interview. That's creating isolation, separation from the background. The halo cuts them out. And what you end up with is you end up with layering, three-dimensional layering. Again, for the same reason, it creates a more convincing three-dimensional representation on our flat screens, TVs, phones, whatever it might be. So this is why I prioritize the shaping with the key and the edge with the backlight. Uh, and hopefully, It'll look great when we're done. Um, just before I set the lights and, and get them uh, on, um, just in terms of placement, there are a few kind of conventions and also practical things you think about. The backlight, I've just kind of put up like this, but I'm going to have um, John, the person we're interviewing, I'm going to have him here 
camera here, and the reason I'm doing that is I'm using the length of the space here and the fairy lights. Um, I'm going to light these little candles as well, so that's going to help with the three-dimensionality, that depth I was talking about, create a bit of a vanishing point. But he's going to be, because of that, because this is the edge that we're using to lead into the frame, he's going to be looking into this space. So when we have the final framing, he will be on the right of frame, on the right third, and there'll be two thirds of empty space that he's looking into. It's called looking room for that reason. So that looking room, traditionally and conventionally, if you're following the rules, your key should be coming from that direction. So my key, this lantern, needs to be over here. It needs to be to the left of my camera so that he's looking into it. And uh, that will create the shade side on this side. This will become the fill side. So that's uh, kind of deciding where this is going to be. Practically, the backlight, if I have it like this, then this is obviously going to end up in shot. So I need this up this end turned around so that we don't obviously end up with all of this stuff in the shot. So in terms of light placement, we just need to think carefully about what's motivating our light source, how that plays with the looking room. And these are just conventions that we ideally should follow, but obviously you can break the rules once you know them. And also just practically getting things up and out of the way in turn so that we don't see them in the frames. Another thing to bear in mind in terms of uh, light placement and positioning, this key I want up high and I want angled down. That will create shadows that go down the face rather than across the face. Having it up and angled down is the correct way um, to place your key if you want to hide that shadow and create that classic Rembrandt triangle. What I'm just doing here is I'm setting up a frame this is a Calumet frame, but uh, Blastolite make them for, you can get any number of different frames. Um, this one's collapsible, which is why it's quite useful. But I'm going to um, put some black, some negative fill in this, uh, just in case. I don't actually know if I need it yet, but it's a quick thing to throw up. Um, uh, I'm going to stick it on a spare stand. I'm just going to have it to hand in case I need it. Because we've got white ceilings and walls, there's a lot of light contamination coming in from outside. It's a bit unpredictable. I want to have this to hand in case I need to block any reflected light from John's face. Um, so I'm just going to have this uh, nearby and we'll see if I need it or not. But negative fill is a really important thing and flags and floppies and various different um, bits of kit like that, accessories. They're really useful to have to hand with you just in case you need to block light, you need to bounce it somewhere else. You know, there's any number of different scenarios where you can be using these accessories to help you um, just in case. You never know when you're in a pinch, these things can help. First thing I'm gonna do because I've got things roughly in the right place. Actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my key. And I just want to focus on getting that backlight. So I'm going to kill this. Probably not in the way that I should do, because I'm just going to kill it at the switch. But I'm not too concerned. OK, so what I want to avoid, just looking at what's in the frame there, because I can't control what's behind John. To a, to a certain extent, I can, but not much. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is make sure that what I can control is right and what I can't control is, is balanced with it. So this backlight, let's just check it's following along. So it's in the same plane, just rotate it a touch. It's in the same plane as John's shoulders. Um, it's coming round. I want to avoid, and the grid will be doing a good job of this, I want to avoid as much as possible it coming and hitting um, John's nose. In fact, it's ever so slightly too far forward, so I'm just going to move it back a touch, just a tiny bit. And John, if you just look over to where your interviewer is going to be, that should give us the control that we need to just get this. So we're just getting this light on the shoulders. Now, obviously, this, this works better the lighter the colours, so the lighter the hair, the lighter the shirt, the, the easier this is to, to get away with, but um, it'll do for now. Um, and we're just adding a little bit of light there just to separate out John from his background. And having a look at it on the camera, it's doing quite a good job. We've also got some natural contrast because we've got the black t-shirt against the lighter white wall behind. So what I'm looking for is contrast. I'm looking for something that will make 
John stand out from his background. I'm doing that with depth of field. I'm doing that with lighting. Uh, the, the dark top helps separate him out from the background as well. And one of the final things I'll do is I'll make sure that um, John's skin and that sort of saturated skin tone is also nice and present and, and dial, maybe dialed down in the grade. Uh, the saturation of the wood behind him to try and bring him out that way. I'm doing lots of little things to essentially bring him forwards and the background falling away. So I've just got John, I've got the lights placed pretty much where I want them. I now need to adjust the intensity, I need to set my exposure. So what I'm doing is I'm rating the camera how I would ideally like it. I want it wide open at 1.2. Um, I need a, a normal shutter angle, 180 degree shutter angle. So that means I'm at 25 frames a second. That means that I'll have a 50th of a second shutter speed, which is 180 degree shutter angle. Um, the other thing that I um, need to make sure is that uh, the exposure, because I'm shooting log, the exposure is bang on. Uh, obviously, I want to make my life as easy as possible when I'm grading this later, but if I was handing it off, it becomes even more important. Um, and I've done that where I've shot, um, I shot on a, a Netflix documentary and I was there for two days and I'm handing off my rushes directly to the producers. So um, if you're in that situation, you need to really make sure that they can just drop the camera that the technical LUTs from the camera manufacturer straight on this footage and this log footage is normalized as easily as possible. Um, trust me, it makes their lives easy and they're more likely to hire you again. So it's worth doing. In this case, I'm shooting Canon Log 2. Um, that white chip, so the, the white spot uh, or line at the top of the chart over there, that's a 90% reflectance white. Um, I know that in Canon Log 2 that drops to 60 IRE. So uh, on my waveform, I'm just going to make sure that that's sitting at 60 and I'll know that the exposure is correct. I'm also going to have a view assist LUT, um, so just a display, a display LUT uh, on the camera so I can sort of just do an eyeball confirmation as well. And then, and then finally, I'm going to record the chart. So there'll be a few seconds of the chart before the interview, which I can take through into post with me and make sure that it's 100% uh, balanced correctly and normalized. And it just makes the grade uh, much, much easier. Settings wise, I'm shooting just standard Ultra HD, so 3840, 2160. I'm at 25 frames a second. Uh, and I'm shooting into HEVC or H.265 in terms of codec. Um, it's a 422 10-bit flavor. More than enough data in there, particularly given how much effort we've made to make sure that it, it looks so good uh, with the lighting and the exposure and the white balance. So plenty of wiggle room. Um, yeah, pretty much ready to go now. I'm going to roll up and do a sound test and then we're going to go straight into the questions and and capture john's interview so i'm uh, john i'm the uh, managing director at uh, great beyond brewing company uh, so i run the business more or less with my business partners i'm originally trained as a brewer but uh you know we started about six months ago and my job is to sort of make things happen here so we're all done shooting our interview with John. I just thought I'd take a second just to give you a few sort of, I don't know, top three tips if you like. Um, with me, with interviews, they are really, really important. I shoot an awful lot of branded content. I work with uh, corporates all the time. And whereas with drama, you know, in TV and film, you have a script, you have an actor delivering your narrative for you, you literally putting words in their mouth to say what you want them to say. Um, whereas we don't have that luxury in brand and content often, um, particularly if we want something that feels relaxed and uh, informal. Of course, you can script things, you can use auto cues and such like. But for an interview like that, I like um, to uh, um, keep it nice, nice and relaxed, try and um, create questions that you hope will elicit the answers that will tell your story for you. So you're kind of working backwards. You think, well, what do we want? What's the messaging from this? What do we want them to say? And let's create a question that will elicit that response. So you have to think about it a bit in, in advance. So my first tip would be to plan questions that will elicit the answers that will tell your story for you as if you've given them a script, but without giving them a script. My second tip is also um, in terms of scripting, uh, you know, the people you're interviewing are almost never going to be actors. They can't memorize lines and deliver them to the camera as if it's the first time they've ever said them. They just 
cannot do that. So don't try and make them because they will turn into an absolute wreck. They won't be able to remember their lines. You will often get pres uh, pressure from the interviewee to give them the questions ahead of time because they feel they want to be prepped. They feel want, they want to write down some notes or even full answers. I've had people write down full answers on cue cards and get colleagues to stand behind me. And it, now, these days in my career, I just push back really hard. I do not want to give them the questions in advance. I always say the same thing to them. I'm not asking you anything hard. I'm not asking you anything that you don't know the answer to. I'm just asking you about your career or the product that you've just launched or whatever it might be. Um, so they have a rough idea of what I'm asking them. They should know anyway, because they've been asked to participate in the project. But I am not going to send them an email with question one, question two, because they will over prepare and it will come across really badly and, and, and wooden on screen and they will try and memorize things and they will forget them and they'll be constantly self editing and it, it just it kind of ruins it. So that's my second tip. Um, my third tip um, will probably come back to what I was saying earlier about prioritizing uh, depth. That's what you, to my mind, in terms of the image, that's what you should be thinking about is depth, whether that's through depth of field, shallow depth of field for um, separation of the subject, that backlight, which is so crucial, I think, to cutting them out and layering them against their background using light or lines or whatever it might be to kind of take the, the framing and, and the viewer's eye through and in. Um, and um, again, with that key, using it to obviously expose your subject, but also having it up, angled down, around, just enough to catch in the eyes, but around enough to throw a shaded side down here. A traditional journalistic, um, very safe uh, style is to have your key twice as bright as your fill. Um, and, and that's kind of what I've gone for today, just a very safe standard kind of uh, uh, two to one lighting ratio. Um, and, and thinking about how you're using light uh, and the frame to, to add that, that depth, because that's really what we want, is we want our viewer to feel in, 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 enveloped by what they're viewing and kind of forget that they are staring at a phone, but feel like they're actually there having a conversation with this person. So those are my top three tips when it comes to shooting interviews. I guess um, a lot of this stuff, well, all of this stuff ultimately, uh, you know, has just been learned over a 15 year career. I've been running Coro Films for um, 15 years now. In fact, 15 years in, in April, just gone. Um, and this is just all my accumulated knowledge from working with various people and tapping into various different resources over the years. Um, and I have to say, you know, this could even be a fourth tip. Um, with my career, I found it really useful because I, I started out originally uh, doing fine art. I got into video through art installation uh, 20 years ago um, uh, and then immediately left and um, started getting sort of more and more technical. Uh, fell in love with sort of uh, the editing side of videoing as well, then color grading. And I think it's really important, certainly in my career, it stood me in good stead, uh, having uh, 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 you know, fingers in multiple pies, you know, being an editor as well as a camera operator, color grading if you can, or doing any kind of color work or any kind of finishing work, work with the picture is really useful. It makes you much better at those other things. I'm a much better uh, camera operator because I edit. I'm a much better um, colorist because I shoot. You know, all these things help each other and um, they help you create a really tight uh, and consistent and, and high quality image. So with my career and my background, starting from you know, fine art, very loose, uh, interpretive, you know, playing around with color and shapes and you know, really being very fluid with what I was doing. O over the years, as I've done more and more and played different roles, uh, everything sort of just tightened up and tightened up. And, and now that allows the technical to just fall away and the creative to be purely creative because I don't get the two all kind of jumbled up and mixed up together anymore. Um, I've got a good handle over all of it. So that, that would be another tip. And also a way of just giving you a little bit of background about me and, and how I ended up here. Um, I guess that's it. Um, thanks for joining me and thank you to Wex for inviting me to share these tips. But uh, hopefully uh, I will see you again soon, maybe in another video or somewhere else out there in the interweb. Uh, but I've been Ollie Kenchington. You can find me on Instagram at Ollie Kenchington. Uh, but until then, thank you very much. <laughs>